We're definitely further ahead than most nickel companies. So when companies are looking at the, the space of nickel juniors and nickel projects, having one with a feasibility study, having one that's fully permitted, definitely ticks many boxes. The long life of Dumont really allows investors increased certainty about hitting several price cycles over the life of the project and maximizing their return. Uh, that 30-year life and then plus upside after that, that really, I think, adds uh, something to our story versus versus other other stories. Hello, welcome to Crux Investor. First of all, thanks so much for watching this video. If you like it, give us a thumbs up and please leave your comments below. It gives us an idea of what you're thinking, what questions you'd like to ask and what you want to know in the future. And if you haven't already done so, please click the subscription button in the corner of the screen. And if you want to see more videos like this, click the notification bell. We spoke today to John Amuninen, who is the president uh, of Dumont Nickel, a division of RNC Minerals. So we spoke with her back in November, where she described the market for 2020 as she saw it then. Obviously, things have changed. COVID-19 and the market reset um, will have changed things for lots of people. So we ask her what it's going to do for the nickel market. Uh, she talks us through that. She talks us through competition in the marketplace, obviously, with their the completion of their feasibility study at the end of last year puts them in quite a strong position and as a key differentiator. We look at financing the business now uh, and in the future, and we talk about their relationship with their partner, Waterton. Lots of other things discussed. Take a look in the description below. If there's anything you want to look at in particular, click the relevant timestamp and I'll take you to that part of the video. So in the meantime, enjoy the video. Hello, Jonah, how are you? I'm good, Matt. How are you doing? Not bad, not bad. I haven't spoken to you since November. And uh, I, I remember when um, RNC Minerals used to be a nickel company. So I thought I'd better get in contact. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. You know, it's uh, different days than the last time uh, than the last time we were together, for sure. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. Uh, a bit of a different world right now. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. I mean, obviously, I think you know you're referring to COVID uh, nineteen impacting on mm -hmm. the way people are, are doing business. But it, but RNC Minerals is a is a very different company too. You guys have done a great job on the gold stuff, bringing in the cash, nice and consistent. Uh, I think the market's um, you know saluting that. So well done to you guys. But the other big piece of this, which I think people have forgotten about, which and I don't think they should have, because it's potentially worth a lot of money is the nickel component component Dumont what's been happening since we last spoke what, are, what we're about to find yeah. out we're about to find out are we <laughs> we are I mean the last time we were able to be together now we're doing it over video calls yeah um, yeah so no we've been we've been busy with Dumont um, we you know if I look at where you know, first, maybe I'll get into a little bit what, what Dumont is for your viewers. Please, Just give, give us that one minute overview. overview again. Beautiful, beautiful. Do this. Kick yeah, off. no, the one minute overview. Um, RNC you know, owns a, has a 28% interest in the Dumont project. Uh, the Dumont project is a nickel sulfide project located in the Abitibi region of Quebec. Um, it is, uh, we've completed an updated feasibility study back in 2019. Uh, we are fully both provincially and federally permitted. And so, you know, really at this point, uh, we're waiting, you know, we've been, we've been waiting for, for a nickel market. And if we look at where we were back in October, November, December, and even earlier this year, you know, we were really starting to come along um, in terms of where the nickel market was and, and getting into a bit of a bull market there. Well, let's, let's talk about that. Because first of all, thanks for the summary. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice reminder to people, you know, how advanced you guys are. Um, the nickel market. Let's talk about it. I agree with you. I think there was a resurgence uh, towards August, September last year. Then I think, as predicted, the scrap kind of came into the market, affected pricing, and but it was it was expected. Um, and you would have thought that the price was price would have sort of recovered kind of mid year this year. But COVID nineteen comes along. I mean, what what's that done for you guys? What's it done for the nickel market more importantly? Well, no, for, for uh, exactly. You know, we talked last October, early November, and uh, and definitely, you know, we thought the market had been a bit overdone. Um, in the summer of 2019, Indonesia announced they were going to pull forward that ore ban, uh, which is still in place. And on the back of that announcement, nickel price took off, inventories fell down. But when you looked at the stainless steel market, it definitely didn't seem to be translating into demand on the day. It wasn't trans. It wasn't coming from demand on the stainless steel side. 
So definitely thought there was probably going to be a bit of a weakness coming into Q1, Q2 of this year. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, with the impact of COVID on top of that, um, obviously, we're definitely seeing that now, both in nickel inventories as well as nickel pricing. Um, Nickel prices held currently somewhere in sort of the uh, $5 pound range. Uh, We've got inventories that have increased uh, over the last two to three months. Um, since January into about 230,000 tons of nickel on the LME. Um, however, you know, we look at that and, and there is definitely an impact from COVID, but, you know, my personal opinion and, and just, you know, when you look at this market, I think we will get past this. You know, fundamentally, uh, the longer term base, uh, you know, the basic fundamentals longer term remains strong. Uh, we have seen a, a deficit in the nickel industry for the last four years, uh, and that was even before the Indonesian ore ban. You know, we'll probably see a bit of a surplus this year, um, however, you know, that's directly related to this slowdown from COVID and, you know, we will catch up to that. Fundamentally, there's been a 10 year period of lack of exploration in the nickel sector. Um, there really just hasn't been anybody out there looking for nickel and there's been a lack of investment in the nickel junior side of things, as well as even the major companies weren't spending the money on exploration that historically they used to do. Um, and really what that translates to is that we're going to see a delay between finding new nickel projects and being be able to bring them on online. If, if, if I may, just interrupt because I, I, there's a bit I don't want to um, uh, f- forget to ask you, which is, you know, if we stick around the impact of COVID now, obviously it, it's impacting people's ability to work now. People are being restricted to their homes. I think mostly glo- globally, most people are adhering to that. Um, it's affecting people you know, family businesses, small businesses, their ability to earn cash. And I think some governments are stepping in, some governments are not. I mean, surely that is going to have an impact on people's buying behavior, which is going to have a knock on effect into the metals market. But do you see that as a, again, a short, I know you're used to dealing with tens of years for the, these these types of large nickel projects, but do you think that's a kind of yeah. short term impact or do you see that not really af- affecting the way that large you know, plays like Nickel tend to want to plan their operations out? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think definitely we'll see, obviously, a short-term drop in consumer demand. You know, people aren't shopping. I think, you know, I've seen some some graphs that show just a hugely dramatic drop in people's buying and people's shopping, which absolutely will have an impact. Um, you know, the stainless steel market, most, sta- most Nickel produced today goes directly into stainless steel. Um, that stainless steel is generally lo- used for infrastructure projects, um, and, and things along those lines. So one of the things that I think will be interesting to see is, you know, in terms of government infrastructure spending and stimulus packages, how will that, uh, how will that really impact the nickel market and, and the economy moving forward? You know, mo- nickel in the ramp up in 2007, most nickel came out of the consumer goods space just because of the price of nickel went up to $25 a pound and it became too expensive. Um, so when we look at, you know, consumer buying, for sure, that will that will impact the demand on nickel. However, I think you know I'm kind of interested to see what happens once we get out of this initial COVID crisis, a month or two from now, when governments really want to stimulate their economy. You know, I think they've already talked about stimulation in China, and China's sort of come out of the initial COVID lockdown, and they're starting to see manufacturing again. Um, I think that would really help nickel on the stainless steel side, and I think that could be a real positive as we move into Q3, Q4 this year, and maybe into next year. And I think on top of that, um, you know, the whole the whole lithium battery um, growth sector and, and the EV market and energy storage market on the battery side of things, you know, I still think is a very exciting place in, you know, coming forward. Um, and I also think that some of the interesting things that people have seen with this slowdown is really the improvement in the environment in cities, um, in the improvement in, uh, in, in, sm- in pollution and smog uh, without all of the... Uh, you know, internal combustion engines driving around. Um, so, you know, once we come out of that, I think people might look at how to do things differently and potentially that could, you know, speed up that uh, that battery, that demand for electric vehicles as well as the demand for battery storage. I love that argument. I think that's so true. I think that is so true. I think people will behave, think, act differently after this because it's going to affect people psychologically, I think. You know, you, you we haven't had anything like this since the Second World War. You know, we haven't been held captive. We haven't been worried about food, toilet roll, um, you know. But, uh, paper. <laughs> I have to throw that in there. Um, uh, energy, you know, 
seeing friends, all of, all of those things you, you take for granted. And yes, some of the benefits, the main beneficiary here is the fact that the world is possibly a, a little bit cleaner. As a result, we're seeing, you know, rivers and waterways, you know, the Thames included, <coughs> making a you know, huge recovery there. So it, it, it is fascinating. So I, I, li I like that argument, probably worth, <clears throat> probably worth exploring more. But there's, I want to talk about you today. Um, yep. So given that world, that picture that you have painted for us, We've spoken to a lot of nickel companies recently. They've all been telling us they're top 10 nickel company, definitely a top 10 uh, at this, that, or the other. How are you positioning yourselves? Because you talked about you know, completion of the feasibility study uh, end of last year, which is great. Um, you, you've talked about having conversations in the past, and obviously you, you're working with Waterton there. So what are you doing? And I guess what's been happening since we spoke to advance things? Within Dumont, with Dumont. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. There's a pile of different questions in there, and I there think was. we can get to all of them. So I'm gonna start looking at, uh, you know, competition. How are we uh, differentiating ourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, you've been talking to lots of nickel companies. Um, with the sort of run up in nickel there, and, and a bit of some tailwinds behind nickel, uh, we're seeing more and more nickels companies or companies that were focused on other things now looking at their nickel assets. Um, for us, you know, I think we have quite a few strengths, uh, specifically around Dumont. Uh, one, jurisdiction. You know, we are in the Abitibi mining region of Quebec. Uh, we have an educated and experienced regional workforce uh, for both construction and operation of the project. Um, the project has amazing infrastructure. We have water. We have rail, a rail line that's on the property. We have an all-weather highway uh, right beside the property. Um, and we have very competitively priced green hydropower, which is located eight kilometers away from the project. Um, so that's, you know, that piece, that, that allows us to be structurally low cost just because we're in the right region. Um, our timeline to construction. You know, I talked a little bit earlier there where I gave a little bit of the blurb, the overview of Dumont. We are both federally and provincially permitted. Um, we have a recently completed feasibility study. And, and so, you know, with those pieces, we are ready to start construction. Um, so for investors that are looking to hit the next upswing in the nickel cycle, we are perfectly positioned for them. The asset itself is a large scale, long life asset. Um, it, you know, I've previously spoken about the nickel market and how volatile it is. You know, Dumont is a 30 year project that on average will produce 39,000 tons of nickel annually. Um, the long life of Dumont really allows investors increased certainty about hitting several price cycles over the life of the project and maximizing their return. Um, you know, if you've got a five to 10 year nickel project, you could theoretically build it and miss the price cycle at the, at the time where you need it to pay back your investors. Uh, that 30 year life and then plus upside after that, that really, I think, adds uh, something to our story versus, versus other, other stories. And then finally, I think one thing that we don't talk about enough that I'd like to start talking about with Dumont is really the green side of things. Um, so not only will Dumont produce nickel and cobalt to supply the low and a low carbon energy storage industry, um, <clears throat> it's also a very low carbon footprint project. 100% of our electricity is hydro sourced, um, and we actually increased the electrification of the project in the updated feasibility study to include to include uh, trolley assist for our haul trucks. What that did is actually reduced our diesel consumption by over 500 million liters over the life of the project or by almost a third, um, which this gives us the advantage. Uh, so when we're talking about to potential investors, um, many of these investors, especially based in Europe, um, have carbon footprint uh, ESG requirements for, for some investments. So I really think um, that that helps us. And that is uh, definitely something that we are a lot, you know, that we can take and we can bring to the table over other projects. Now that, that, that stuck out when you were talking um, about green hydro power there, I was going to ask you, it's not something we've talked about um, before. Okay, we, we've looked at projects which are, you know, bat battery related. And you, you talk about how do you get a truly green end to end green solution here. And we talked about at the, the back end here, with a, it's a fantastic Australian company called Neometals, which is doing a recy battery recycling project, which is getting back you know, you know, huge percentage of the commodities which have gone into the batteries and then re recycling, reusing them. And we like that, but no one's really talked about the front end, which is, as you say, all of that 
diesel, and that you know that you know dirty power um, that that's used for mining and the way that miners um, behave. Their ESG is not usually up to scratch. It's interesting that you've you've thought about that, and I agree. We've got some pretty big funds here in London who have pretty much changed their rationale for investing based on that. So. Like that, that that's that's fascinating fascinating um yeah and, and no and actually one of the one of the pieces of work that we're talking about right now is looking at you know we had to quantify our greenhouse gas um, emissions from the project for our environmental permitting process through the through the province um, however you know looking at that life cycle of including all of our reagents that we have to buy including the transportation of those to sites um, as well as the fact that both our tailings and our waste rocks have the ability to sequester carbon mm. passively. Um, we are looking at trying to quantify the whole picture um, so that we have that for our potential investors. But I do think moving forward, that is just going to be a very important piece that we can bring to the table um, for, for various investors that are much more ESG focused today than they were five years ago. Well, absolutely. well let, let's talk about that because um, you're going to need some point of differentiator uh, because according to a lot of companies we're talking to, They've got fantastic projects as well. I don't think they're anywhere near as advanced as you, uh, in, in all honesty. But nevertheless, they're going to be talking to the same people as you. So can you give us a sort of idea of timing? Because, you again, you, you talked about being able to hit the cycle at the right time, being able to um, insert yourself um, to benefit from you know, an up, uptick in, in price, etc. Where are you with regards to conversations and the timing for actually monetizing this. I'm not saying, I'm not going to ask you too much about monetization because I know you're not going to tell us <laughs> of any, you're not going to give anything back away there. But what are those conversations like? Let me put it like that as opposed to where are you with them? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, it's, it's been an interesting time. You know, in the last six to eight months, right up until PDAC um, in early March, we, we were seeing some significant positive overall market signs. Um, that definitely had us considering a much more focused marketing approach for 2020. Um, and including that when we look at, um, and I'm not, you know, talking, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about conversations specifically with us, but when we look at, um, you know, some of the major mining companies around the world, um, they've been publicly stating a shift in focus um, and now are, you know, publicly stating that they want to look at nickel sulfide resources and they want to look to add those to their portfolios or they're looking at funding additional nickel exploration projects. Um, I think in general, in the fall and early in the winter, nickel was definitely getting some, starting to get some tailwinds. Um, and while the short-term market is going to be a bit soft, um, you know, many were starting to look at the medium and longer term, uh, knowing that there's a timeline to get these things into construction, to get them into production. And, and you know, as, as we've indicated, as we said, we're definitely further ahead than most nickel companies. So when companies are looking at the, the space of nickel juniors and nickel projects, um, you know, having one with a feasibility study, having one that's fully permitted, definitely ticks many boxes, um, more so than some of the projects that are earlier stage where they're still drilling um, or looking to, you know, to get into just starting either a PEA or a pre-feasibility study. Um, also, I think, you know, some of them, I think for the last, earlier in the fall and early mid last year, people were still deciding how they want to divest in the battery space. I think, you know, there's a lot of ways people talk about the battery space. People are very excited about it. However, how do you want to invest in it? Are you looking at lithium? Are you looking at nickel? Are you looking at cobalt or copper? Um, and I think, you know, over the last six to nine months, we've really seen a couple things. One is that almost all battery chemistries, for especially for electric vehicles, are trending towards more and more nickel. Um, as well as when you look at major mining companies, most of them are very familiar with operating base metal assets such as copper, such as nickel, um, as opposed to, say, lithium. Um, so in terms of major mining companies that are looking around, um, nickel would be familiar and in the real house. Um, so one of the main drivers for the timing for us to update the Dumont feasibility study was really around being able to come into what we saw as an upcoming bull market for nickel um, with a current technical report um, so that we could go out and, and really start to market again. Now, obviously, I think uh, the COVID pandemic has slowed everything down in the short term, but I really do feel confident that once we get through this, um, I think we're going to regain the momentum that we were seeing in the nickel market that we saw earlier this year and late last year. You know, the fundamentals remain strong and the world does need more nickel. Um, we are, Dumont's well positioned to weather the storm um, without any near-term financing requirements. 
Um, so then we will be well positioned to be able to emerge from from the current uh, from the current economic crisis, the COVID uh, the COVID pandemic, and uh, we'll be ready to hit the ground running when okay. the markets return. I know you're fully financed. I know you're not. You don't need to. Although, quite frankly, you could these days because I think um, the, the the gold business is throwing off so much cash at the moment. Um, you don't. There's no reliance to go and ask um, Paul for more money. You're fully financed to take you through to what? What, what, what kind of to, to when? Yeah. So, so the way I mean, I've talked about this a little bit before. We own 28% of Dumont. Dumont is 100% owned within the uh, JV that we have with Waterton, um, and the financing for the Dumont work is contained within that JV. Um, as part of the initial uh, agreement back in 2017, uh, the RNC's portion of that funding was provided by Waterton in a segregated account. Um, we are well financed to complete the work that we planned for 2020, um, and then and then. You know, if things continue slow, we are able to hold the project for another several years without any additional financing. Um, and that includes maintaining the project team um, and all the brain trust that sort of has worked for the last 10 to 12 years on Dumont so that we don't have to lose that as we move forward. Got it. Um, Got it. Okay. Yeah, so in the medium to medium to mid- midterm, there's no requirement for RNC to have to provide any additional financing. I think that's interesting. Again, a lot of the juniors we've been, we've been talking to have been cognizant of, you know, saying we are... We're running out of cash, but we're, we we can't lose the. I think you just want the brain stress, the people with the knowledge here, because mm-hmm. if we have to lay them off, we're not sure to get them back on. It's, it's a real con- real concern, um, for sure. And um, can we just finish off? Can you remind me of what were the highlights from the feasibility study with regards to the numbers in terms of cost, returns, scale, etc. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so we fit, we completed the feasibility study last year. Um, it is a uh, NP, it has an NPV of 8% of $920 million U.S. Uh, it's a, over a 15% rate of return, 15.4% rate of return. Uh, we have an all-in sustaining cost of uh, less than $4 U.S. a pound. Um, the project itself will produce an average, it, it's, two, it's a two-phase project approach. Uh, the initial phase, which is the first seven years, will produce an average of 33,000 tons of nickel per year, um, and that will be expanding to 50,000 tons per nickel annually um, after that for the next sort of for the first 20 years. Um, overall, the project itself is a 30-year life project, and the free cash flow, um, once we're in operation over the life of the project, is around $200 million per year. Wow, okay. And what are you going to need um, to raise? Sorry, I missed that number. The initial the initial capital is a, is a billion dollars US. Okay, so it's not big by nickel terms. It's not big by nickel terms. I mean, it's very mm. much if we look at even by um, sort of larger scale gold operations. If you look where we are operating in the Abitibi, um, you know, it's a billion dollars to build a fifty thousand ton per day plant. Um, you look at Malarctic, which is owned, which uh, is about sixty kilometers south of us. It's a large gold mine that was built in two thousand and nine for about eight hundred and. $50 million. Um, if you look at Detour Gold, which is on the other side of the border from us in Ontario, again, that was more remote and needed a camp. Um, however, it needed uh, more power infrastructure. However, that was built for about $1.2, $1.3 billion, um, for about the same size mill. So roughly within the area that we're operating, we have people that are experienced in how to build these large mills um, it recently. Um, that you know that is one of the, the biggest advantages with where the project is located. We get to take advantage of all that experience. No, that's, that's fantastic. Well, Jenna, thanks very much for the update. Um, and you know, please stay in touch with us. Uh, obviously, as we move through and sort of work out when we can get back to some sense of normality or some semblance of normality, should I say? Uh, it'd be good to sort of see you know how you're getting on with regards to conversations in the marketplace, and you know, can you move this forward? I mean, you are. Well, the most advanced uh, nickel company that we've we've spoken to. So um, I guess people are paying attention to you. Yeah, no, and I mean, I think, you know, we are, you know, we and, you know, right now we're seeing a bit of the lull on the market side, but I do want to be clear that we're, we are actively working on um, items to move the project forward internally. Um, you know, so we've got a few things that we're looking at this year. We have, you know, since we, lived, we last spoke, uh, we did approve the 2020 work plan. And that work plan really focuses on sort of three different things. Uh, one is maintaining our shovel-ready status. 
So that's one thing we're very proud of in terms of we have permitting. Uh, we are ready to go into detailed engineering. Uh, with the completion of the 2019 feasibility study, um, we need to update uh, some of our documents, which includes things like the closure plan, um, which is a critical element in finalizing the mining lease. Um, so, and that maintain that goes towards maintaining our shovel ready status. Um, and all, and also we need to be able to communicate with all of our stakeholders uh, what the results of the 2019 feasibility study were. Um, that includes shareholders, and obviously, you know, we were on your show a couple times, as well as just the local community, uh, local governments, provincial governments. Um, so that you know, we've been starting that, and we're going to work continue to work through that in the next sort of six months. So we've been working on on things like that, where really we can take advantage of the time now um, to really reduce any sort of uh, schedule or cost risk to the construction phase. Um, and, yeah. and uh, you know, and in terms of the feasibility identified several opportunities to add value to the project. So we are looking at several of those items. Um, and we're going to be looking at how we can add more information, add data and bring some of those opportunities closer to fruition over the next few months. Fantastic. You sound as pumped up as Paul was when I last spoke to him. What, what, what are you guys drinking? <laughs> you know, I'm pretty excited. Seriously. I'm pretty excited about the nickel market in general. I mean, I think we uh, we need to get through this current period, but I think long term the fundamentals are good. Um, I know I'm a nickel bull, um, but uh, but definitely, definitely I think it's an it's an opportunity Dumont's been waiting for in terms of the market um, having one of the few nickel projects that is able to be delivered. Um, and built in in short order, um, you know, being able to take advantage of that. I think when we look at the world, uh, there just hasn't been enough exploration in nickel over the net last 10 years. So we're able to really di differentiate ourselves between us and other nickel companies uh, just because we do have a project that has a feasibility study that is fully permitted and we are ready to go into engineering, detailed engineering and construction. Well, look, I'm, I'm ex you're excited. I'm excited for you because I don't think the market is giving you uh, credit for the nickel component. I, you know, I think that um, it's all valued on what's happening with the gold. Um, if you can move this thing forward this year, you know, um, I, and I, I hope you can. Um, I'm to, referring to COVID-19, not, not, nothing else. I hope the market does recover, and you are able to demonstrate to us and, and your shareholders exactly what it is worth. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be nice. It'd be nice to see. I'm sure you, you'll be delighted. I'm sure Paul will be delighted. Um, we wish <laughs> no, you well. We wish, wish you well with that. Thank you so much, Matt. No, thank you very much for having me on. It was good to catch up with you again. Beautiful. Speak to you soon.